Welcome. You are about to view a recorded talk from the online seminar series Progress and Visions in the Scientific Study of the Mind-Matter Relation, held in 2018. The seminars aim to bring together researchers from around the globe with a background in mathematics or physics who are interested in the scientific study of consciousness and the mind-matter relation. While each seminar session consists of a talk and a discussion, the latter is not recorded and the following video will only contain the talk. We hope you enjoy it. For further information, please visit mind-matter-relation.org. Thank you very much for having me, you guys, and thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I am indeed an eclectic freak. Um, and I also um, am doing this talk from home, and I just got out of bed, so forgive me for being a disembodied voice, but you, you really wouldn't <laughs> want to see me at the moment. So <laughs> believe it or not, I'm, I'm sparing you. Um, so the stuff that I'm going to talk about today comes directly out of the book that you're presumably looking at the cover of right now uh, that, that just came out. Um, and uh, I, obviously I can't do justice to you know, the details of this book, but um, if you're interested in what I'm talking about and you want more details, this is the place to look. So here's an overview of what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna briefly talk about other ways of relating physics or mathematics to conscious experience. I'm gonna talk about the generation or the hard problem I'm gonna talk about what does a generation problem look like if we reject the assumptions that generate it. I'm gonna talk about clues, you know, given that rejection, do we, can we get some clues from physics? And in particular, I'm gonna focus on what I'm gonna call adynamical or a causal physics. You can think of Lagrangian physics if you want, but I'll give you more examples. And then I'm gonna talk about neutral monism as suggested by the title, block universe and the experience of time and why I think physics is already psychology. So if that already sounds astoundingly weird and different to you, then it's gonna get worse. Um, so here are some of the more explored ways of relating physics to conscious experience. So relating uh, the quantum mechanical wave function, typically it's conceived in a realistic way to conscious experience. So this is stuff we all have read and know about, for example, how conscious experience emerges from quantum mechanics or how conscious experience acts upon quantum mechanical processes like collapsing the wave function or what have you. So, and this stuff has been around for decades, obviously, and it rears its head and goes away again and comes back and, you know, they're fads, but we've all seen this stuff. Another big one is modeling cognition using the formalism of non-relativistic quantum mechanics, such as making a decision Right, we can say it's sort of like moving from a superposition to wave function collapse, uh, where you make a definite decision. I, I don't. I, nothing I'm saying here is exhaustive. Obviously, there are many, many other programs out there. I'm just saying these are standard ways of trying to play this game. So what I want to focus, and I'm not going to do any of those. That's the point. <laughs> so uh, you can decide whether that's good or bad. So what I'm going to focus on is the generation problem sometimes called the hard problem, but for my purposes, it's better to put it this way. And the, the problem is this, we all know it. How does mere matter generate conscious experience? This is supposed to be the big mystery that drives consciousness studies. And uh, of course, as with any philosophical problem, it, it's driven by certain assumptions and it, those assumptions are what lead to the problem. So as Barbara Montero suggests in this passage, here's the, one of the assumptions. Instead of construing the mind-body problem as finding a place for mentality in a fundamentally physical world, we should think of it as the problem of finding a place for mentality in a fundamentally non-mental world, a world that at its most fundamental level is entirely non-mental. Similar claim from Dave Chalmers, what drives the hard problem, as he says, you need the background of materialism to get the hard problem off the ground. And as we know, there are people who are now willing to question that assumption, and I'm gonna question it as well in a particular way. So where are we right now with the generation problem? Well, historically we know, like say starting in, starting in the early 90s, that good old fashioned reductionists, materialists, mechanists, right? You know, think of like Crick here, predicted that once cognitive neuroscience got in the game, we would soon at least have the neural correlate of conscious experience, or at least some subset of conscious experience. 
This is the view that Searle called biological naturalism. And the idea was really simple. Look, conscious experience is just, you know, a brain-based phenomenon. We just start by figuring out the neural correlate, and then we'll go from there and figure out the exact mechanism or mechanisms themselves. But to make a long story short that I obviously can't spend any time on, that hasn't really panned out yet. Maybe it will. And it's led some prominent researchers, including those that were once hardcore biological naturalists, to look for another paradigm. Here's an example we're all familiar with. One of those hardcore biological naturalists was Christoph Koch, a famed neuroscientist, cognitive neuroscientist does consciousness studies. And here you see him in an interview about five years ago, explaining why he moved to the IIT theory, which many of you are familiar with, of consciousness. So away from biological naturalism toward an information theoretically based kind of panpsychism in which we find some sort of information theoretic correlate, in this case, phi, uh, to you know, model and or explain consciousness. And we've seen more and more of this sort of stuff lately, which I would assume these other information theoretic and formal accounts, such as network theories, are on the rise. And uh, the hope is that they're going to find at least some, to use an old school world from a word from psychology, I would say they're looking for an isomorphism that links brain states or informa information theoretic treatments of brain states or more abstract uh, like network descriptions of brain states to conscious experience. So even if you don't think of it as an answer to the hard problem as such, at least you're getting some sort of principle or isomorphism or whatever. And this is not unlike the sort of thing that Dave Chalmers suggested to look for in his book, famous book. And I, again, I would assume that part of the reason people are once again excited about trying to mathematize or formally model consciousness or hook up consciousness to physics is because these sorts of alternative accounts to biological naturalism are on the rise at the moment. And I would, and again, I can't go into this at any length, but I would say so far, once again, we have no holy grail here. Some people might disagree. Maybe they think IIT is the magic or they think something else is, but I would say at least there's no consensus answer in this area yet. So what, what I want to ask is, what assumptions got us here? How, how did we get into this generation problem to begin with? Maybe it's time to go back and revisit some of those assumptions. As we often do historically in physics and elsewhere, when we run into a problem, sometimes we have to go back and rethink what got us into the problem. So here are the assumptions that I want to talk about. First, that matter is fundamental and inherently non-conscious. Second, that consciousness is an intrinsic property, meaning that it's something like qualia, tropes of seeing red and feeling pain and so on. That's often how we talk about consciousness. And finally, whether in terms of emergence or some dual aspect type theory, and by the way, when I say dual aspect type theory, I mean that in the broadest possible sense to include all the flavors of panpsychism. So the deepest explanation on this sort of view for conscious experience is going to be a dynamical one of some sort, just as we often think is the case in physics, such as with differential equations. And I want to question, in this book, we question all these assumptions. And as long as these assumptions are in play, we're stuck with the generation problem, and we're stuck with what I'd argue are a bunch of problematic accounts of the relationship between conscious experience and matter. And obviously, again, I can't now spend a lot of time beating up on all the flavors of panpsychism and so on, but we all know that they have serious problems. I don't mean that they're, they, some of them, they may be, they may not be insurmountable, et cetera, but there we go. So I propose, we propose to reject these assumptions. So it's worth trying to rethink the nature of consciousness and matter as we consider the generation problem. So let's go back to physics for a second. Can we find some clues? Can we find some clues for how we might rethink this? Because again, the mystery here is supposed to be, how does matter and motion generate, give rise to conscious experience? Or how does it emerge from 
physical processes that are inherently non-conscious. Well, when we look, let's table consciousness for a second. When we look at physics, we all know that there are plenty of formalisms and explanations within physics that aren't dynamical, even for physical phenomena. So for example, again, uh, the book is loaded with formal details about all this. I can't do that here, but we all know this stuff. We know that there are, there's always a Lagrangian version of a Hamiltonian equation of motion. You can always tell the Lagrangian story. Typically though, we tend to think that the Lagrangian story is just a mathematical trick and that the real story is the Hamiltonian or the dynamical one, but maybe that's not true. So other examples in physics that I think are important uh, are in terms of various adynamical global constraints. Again, which we're all familiar with. Think about special relativity, we have the light postulate and the relativity principle. Not dynamics. Conservation laws, adynamical global constraints. A boundary of a, the boundary of a boundary principle. This is, you know, for example, in the in the Black Bible, in you know Wheeler, you know, Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler, uh, they go to great lengths to show that this principle from topological set theory is what underlies a lot of conservation laws across a number of physical theories. So. Again, I could say more, but you get the idea. There, there's this other tradition in physics that's not about dynamical explanation, which again, we often think of as secondary, but we needn't think of it as secondary. So in the book, we provide a detailed realistic psi epistemic account of quantum mechanics in terms of the a dynamical global constraints, say, as opposed to retrocausal accounts or dynamical interpretations more generally. And I can't go into it here because that's not the point of this talk. But you, you're all probably familiar with retrocausal accounts where, you know, people like Price give themselves a future boundary condition, and then they try to, or Kramer, and they try to tell a story about, you know, backwards causal processes that thread the light cone. And, you know, in other words, they're giving up the independence assumption from Bell. And then we don't have to worry now, we have this backwardly causal weirdness, but we don't have to worry about, you know, true non-locality. We don't have to worry about causal processes that are at space-like separation. But what we do, again, to make a long story short, is say, look, once you, have the, once you have the future in play, maybe it's time to say, give up dynamical thinking altogether and start thinking about explaining things like entanglement, which is what we do, in terms of adynamical global constraints. In our case, we show how to explain quantum correlations entanglement using these 4D space-time global constraints. So again, I'm just trying to give you a flavor for this sort of thinking. If you're really interested in that, you can go read the book and see how it goes. So to make a long story short again, based on considerations from quantum relativity and quantum gravity, we argue that matter is not separable from space-time. It is not fundamentally a dynamical process unfolding in space-time. And therefore, one can take seriously the idea of explanation in terms of adynamical global constraints operating on space-time matter. That's what we're going to call it. We call this idea spatiotemporal contextuality. And obviously, where am I going with this? You know, if we start thinking about the physical world in this different way, then it changes the problematic of the generation problem. That's where I'm headed. That's why I'm putting you through all this. So if all that sounds utterly crazy to you, and it wouldn't be surprising if it did for a variety of reasons, because for one thing, our everyday experience is dynamical. And therefore it's not surprising that when we start cooking up theories before we get to Lagrangians and least action principles and all that sort of stuff, it's not surprising we cook up stuff like Newtonian mechanics because it just maps directly onto our phenomenological experience. But we know that it may not be like that. It may not really be what's fundamental. So here's somebody else who's thinking in a crazy way, Ravelli. Uh, he says the following, general relativity altered the classical understanding of the concepts of space and time in a way which is far from being fully understood yet. Quantum mechanics challenged the classical account of matter and causality to a degree which is still the subject of controversies. After the discovery of general relativity, we are no longer sure what space and time are. And after the discovery of quantum, we are no longer sure of what matter is. The very distinction between space and time and matter is likely to be ill-founded. I think it is fair to say that today we do not have a consistent picture of the physical world. 
So there's a person with far more credibility than myself making the same point. So maybe you can take it seriously. And the idea here is obviously, look, you know, once we took on board space time and we realized that that was just one thing, now maybe, and we think, especially if we think about this from the point of view of fundamental theories and quantum gravity, now maybe we need to take seriously the idea that matter is not a separate thing either. And of course, the other point that he's making is, you know, we act like we know what matter is, and we act like we know what consciousness is when we have these discussions about the generation problem or the hard problem. But the reality is, there is no settled consensus interpretation of quantum, our best formal theory of matter. And there's not, not, not even a consensus about consciousness other than phenomenology. So we, we're free to play here. So what we do in the book, is we take the following view about quantum, about matter. And again, I can't go into any detail. I'm just trying to give you a flavor. We say that the quantum system is in fact the totality of the entire experimental setup. Such the different setups or configurations are not probing some autonomous quantum realm, but actually constitute different systems. Quantum mechanics then is a theory that is quantum classical contextuality at its heart. That is the deepest lesson about the nature of physical reality in quantum from our point of view. As Ball puts it, the quantum experiment is not probing the phenomena, but is the phenomena. Given our Lagrangian approach, the entire experimental setup includes future boundary conditions, the experiment from initiation to termination in 4D space time. So Hilbert space on this view is just a calculational device. It's not really there. So it goes without saying then that on this view, Quantum classical contextuality goes beyond the kind of contextuality often associated with, say, the Cauchy Specter theorem. Now, I understand that if you don't read the book or you haven't read our work and you read this slide, you're thinking, oh, they're instrumentalists. But we're not. We give a very realistic account of the quantum in terms of discretized graph theory, and I can't go into it now. But the point is, there's definitely an ontology there but you have to understand that the fundamentals are 4D and not things that are time evolved. And you have to understand that this is a rejection of the idea that quantum is fundamental to classical and somehow we build, somehow the classical emerges out of the quantum. No, we don't, we think they're both co-fundamental and we talk about it in, in great detail, but that's the idea here. And the deeper idea here is, that reality looks like this. In other words, what is matter on our view? Well, there's nothing more to be said about it. It's not something with intrinsic properties an autonomous identity or primitive thisness or whatever term you wanna use. That it's contextuality and relations is what's fundamental. Just as an example, think about the twin slit or think about you know uh, the Bell experiment. Just as we see, in, in directly in quantum mechanics itself, we should take very seriously the idea that contextuality is fundamental. And that from that context and those relations, we derive or we build up things that what we call objects in space and time. And again, the book is loaded with gory formal details. So I'm just trying to give you a picture. So we call this view the relational block universe for reasons that I hope are now obvious, and we all know what a block universe is, the reality of the past, present, and future. So if you add the sort of contextuality that I've been discussing to that idea, then that approximates what we're trying to talk about in the book. And so what we see ourselves as doing, this is a quote from Wilczek, the Nobel Prize winner. I say Nobel Prize winner because since he agrees with us and he's a Nobel Prize winner, then you know we can't be wrong. So um, Here's what he says, and this is what we see ourselves as doing. A reoccurring theme in natural philosophy is the tension between the God's eye view of reality, comprehended as a whole, and the ant's eye view of consciousness, which senses a succession of events in time. Since the days of Isaac Newton, the ant's eye view has dominated fundamental physics. We divide our description of the world into dynamical laws that paradoxically exist outside of time, according to some, and initial conditions on which those laws act. The dynamical laws do not determine which initial conditions describe reality. That division has been enormously useful and successful pragmatically. 
but at least as far short of a full scientific account of the world as we know it. The account it gives, things are what they are because they were what they were, raises the question, why were those things that way and not any other? The God's eye view seems in the light of relativity theory to be far more natural. Relativity teaches us to consider space-time as an organic whole whose different aspects are related by symmetries that are awkward to express if we insist on carving experience into time slices. So, and then he, uh, finally he says, to me, ascending from the ant's eye view to the God's eye view of physical reality is the most profound challenge for fundamental physics in the next hundred years. So we take this challenge and this view very, very seriously. Imagine that space-time is one thing. So now we can ask, if you can allow yourself to take all that insanity on board, now we can ask, so what does the generation problem look like from this point of view? Because again, remember, one of the assumptions behind the generation problem was not only that matter was essentially non-conscious or non-mental, which I don't think is in any way warranted based on what little we know about the nature of matter. And then there was the assumption that consciousness was qualia-like. I'll come back to that one in a minute. There was finally this assumption that we wanted to know how matter in motion generates conscious experience or how consciousness emerges from matter in motion. But obviously, if you take on board everything I've just said, we can question that premise that leads to that assumption that leads to the hard problem. So if this is a block universe in which matter is primarily not some substance or process with intrinsic properties and autonomous existence unfolding in time, then what about conscious experience? In other words, what does the generation problem now look like from the point of view of this kind of block universe and this picture of matter that I've just described to you. So one colorful way we might put this is you can talk about now, what does the generation problem look like from the perspective of certain fictional beings that many of you will have read about that have this quote unquote God's eye view. I don't know phenomenologically what it would mean to have this God's eye view, but we know that science fiction and literature is full of such speculations. So uh, there's the famous example of the heptapods from the movie Arrival, which actually goes back to a, a, you know, a story. Um, and then perhaps even more famously, uh, the Trail Famidorians from Slaughterhouse-Five. And this is how Vonnegut describes what it's like to be a Trail Famidorian, who somehow experiences the block universe, whatever that would mean. And the Trail Famidorian says to the Earthling the following, it would take another earthling to explain it to you. Earthlings are the great explainers, explaining why this event is structured as it is, telling how other events may be achieved or avoided. I am a Tralfamidorian, seeing all time as you might see a stretch of the Rocky Mountains. All time is all time. It does not change. It does not lend itself to warning or explanations. It simply is. So minus the explanatory uh, eliminativism, that the Trump and Midorian suggest, we can ask ourselves this question. What does the generation problem look like from that perspective, instead of from the matter in motion perspective? Now, let me stop to add a caveat, because we're talking about a block universe here, which means we have to talk about the experience of time. And many people feel like that invoking a block universe, which we argue for at length in the book, based on relativity and quantum mechanics. And we also argue that not only is there good reason to believe it's a block universe based on physics, but we think that it being a block universe actually does some physical and philosophical work. Many, many advocates of block universe are out there, but somehow it never changes their view about anything. They never, they never put it to work in any interesting way, other than the retrocausal quantum people, I would say. But we really take it seriously. But if you take it seriously, you are presumably stuck with uh, an, an, extra burden, an extra burden when it comes to the generation problem or the hard part problem. Namely, how are you gonna explain the experience of time? And the experience of time 
is typically divided as follows. We have passage, that the world is in constant flux, such that the future becomes the present and the present becomes the past. We have presence, that the present moment is experienced as special or ontologically privileged. And we have direction. Time appears to flow from a distinguished past to a distinguishable future. I would say that these are not only a subset of the hard problem or the generation problem, I would say that this is the most basic human experience, conscious experience phenomenologically. It's at the very heart of the hard problem. And the reason people think that the block universe makes this especially hard or that taking special relativity or Minkowski space-time realistically makes this especially hard is because obviously none of these three things are in that formalism. Uh, or in or in the formalism, or even worse, if we move to things like Wheeler DeWitt, it's it's even worse than relativity, even worse than general relativity, certainly worse than special relativity. So when we look at what we take often to be our best formal presentations, we see no mathematical or physical correspondent to what we experience on a daily basis. Some people think this is reason enough to reject this. And we're all familiar with the fact that there are now a slew of theories such as those by Smolin that say that the only way we can fix this is somehow if we stick, you know, presence and passage into our fundamental physics. But we think, in fact, that this problem of time is, is also explicable in the way that we're going to recharacterize experience. And that brings me to neutral monism. So, I've given you a recharacterization from the matter and motion idea of what the physical is. And now I want to do the same thing for conscious experience. We think that all of this, and this is an old tradition, but we think that all the things we've been saying should suggest or at least open us up to the possibility of something that's been around for a while called neutral monism. And it, if it's not, if you don't know about it, you you will learn that neutral monism is certainly a rejection of the idea that experience or consciousness is qualia-like or or trope-like. So, in its most general form, what does neutral monism say? It says mental and material features are real, but in some specified sense, reducible to or constructible from a neutral basis in a non-eliminative sense of reduction. The neutral basis is generally not conceived as a substance, say, unlike dual aspect theories. And mental and material features are not separable or merely correlated. They are non-dual. Indeed, they are not essentially different and distinct. Now, it's really important to understand that neutral monism, and historically, and even now, these things often get confused, neutral monism is not panpsychism, and it's not a dual aspect theory. So even though with panpsychism, even though there are now a million different flavors of it, the basic idea, what makes it panpsychism, is that whatever is physically fundamental, whatever it is, you, 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 know, you plug in your favorite story, that somehow that has at least some proto-experience. Neutral monism says nothing like that. It's not a dual aspect theory. Dual aspect theories say there's some neutral base, and then somehow, the mental and the material, the physical, you know, somehow they emerge from that and they are correlated in some fashion. So in the dual aspect theory, they are dual. They're just correlated, whether by physics or God or whatever, you know, who knows. But neutral monism really is really rejecting that. The mental and the material are truly non-dual. They are not essentially different and distinct. So you have to really, and, Many people just think there's something incoherent about that idea from the get-go, but it's been around a long time, and hopefully it will seem like a possible contender by the time I'm done talking about it. So here's a famous Bertrand Russell, who held every possible view about the mental over time, also, at least at one point in time, held this kind of view about neutral monism. And the whole idea, again, is if we take neutral monism seriously, we deflate the generation problem because you don't have something distinct, right, emerging from matter and matter being defined as essentially non-conscious. So here's how Bertrand Russell puts it. The whole duality of mind and matter is a mistake. 
There's only one kind of stuff out of which the world is made. And this stuff is called mental in one arrangement and physical in the other. That, again, there's many, no doubt there are many brands of neutral monism, but it's this Russellian, you know, William Jamesian version that I want to focus on here. Here's William James, probably the most famous proponent of neutral monism. A given undivided portion of experience taken in one context of associates plays the part of the knower or a state of mind or consciousness, while in a different context, the same undivided bit of experience plays the part of a thing known of an ob objective content. In a word, in one group, it figures as a thought and another group as a thing. So unfortunately, William James and others, when they tried to talk about that neutral that gets divided into subject and object, they often used phrases that sounded a lot like sense data theory or idealism or whatever, but you have to, you have to be charitable and understand that they're really not invoking sense data theory or some sort of idealism. So again, here's James. My thesis is that if we start with the supposition that there's only one primal stuff or material in the world, by the way, James does not mean substance by that, a stuff of which everything is composed, and if we call that stuff pure experience, so there you see the mistake of sounding like a sense data theorist, the knowing can easily be explained as a particular sort of relation towards one another into which portions of pure experience may enter. The relation itself is part of pure experience. One of its terms becomes the subject or bearer of the knowledge, the knower, the other becomes the object known. I'll explain this diagram in more detail. I just wanna to try to give you some pictorial representation of what he's talking about. I'll get to pure presence in a second. So what is the idea of neutral monism? The idea is the following. The claim that the world is carved at the joints, all of physical versus mental or inner versus outer, or subject versus object is not a datum of experience, but rather an inductive projection. So from this point of view, the generation problem, the hard problem as typically conceived is a cognitive illusion. It's based on a faulty inference. So we tend to think that it really is a datum of experience, but it isn't. It's a philosophical inference. Experience isn't inherently or essentially mental, and the external world isn't inherently non-mental. And here's some other quotes from James that I hope will start to convey the idea. And th this is such a, a weird idea because we are so used to thinking in those more dual terms. And it's the, at that sort of thinking that generates the hard problem. So it's, and, and it's kind of how we experience the world. So I'm hoping that some of these passages will at least create a gestalt switch that'll at least make you appreciate that this is a possible view, even if it's one that you don't have any, uh, you know, any enthusiasm for. So here's some quotes from James. Pure experience in itself is no more inner than outer. It becomes inner by belonging to an inner, it becomes outer by belonging to an outer world. Subjectivity and objectivity are not affairs of what an experience is aboriginally made of, but it's a classification. Things and thoughts are not at all fundamentally heterogeneous. They are made of one and the same stuff. Again, don't think substance. Stuff which cannot be defined as such, but only experience, and which one can call, if one wishes, the stuff of experience in general. Subjects knowing, things known are roles played, not ontological facts. Consciousness, as it is ordinarily understood, does not exist any more than does matter. Now, that last quote is probably the most famous. And when people give that quote, they often stop, you know, after the word exist. And then people tend to think that James has a deflationary account of consciousness. But it's not deflationary. Yes, he is rejecting the very idea of qualia, but he's not being an eliminativist about conscious experience. Right, And when you add the extra phase, phrase, any more than does matter, then his view becomes very clear. This is what neutral monism is about. He's not rejecting the common sense obvious fact that mind and matter exist, but they're not what you think they are. 
That's the point of neutral monism. Let me try it one more time. Neutral monism, this is a quote by Evan Thompson. And uh, this idea of neutral monism, you can find it in Buddhism and Hinduism, obviously going back way before James. I don't know if James was, you know, I don't know what, what he knew about these, these traditions. But here I think is a really nice statement of neutral monism from the Yogacara Buddhist uh, view. Take a moment of visual awareness, such as seeing the blue sky on a crisp fall day. The ego consciousness makes the visual awareness feel as if it's my awareness and makes the blue sky seem the separate and independent object of my awareness. In this way, the ego consciousness projects a subject object structure onto awareness. According to the Yogacara philosophers, however, the blue sky isn't really a separate and independent object that's cognized by a separate and independent subject. Rather, there's one impression or manifestation that has two sides or aspects, the outer seeming aspect of the blue sky and the inner seeming aspect of the visual awareness. What the ego consciousness does is to reify these two interdependent aspects into a separate subject and a separate object. But this is a cognitive distortion that falsifies the authentic character of the impression or manifestation as a phenomenal event. So if you can wrap your mind around that, then you have some sense of what neutral monism is trying to get at. It is completely a deflation of the generation problem in the hard problem. But it's not a limit to this in any way. So from this point of view, let's talk about some things. So what is conscious experience from this point of view? Well, it's not qualia, it's just subjectivity. There is no conscious experience without a subject. There's no such thing as free floating qualia or you know, uh, aggregations of qualia. There's just subjectivity. Where there are perceptions, there is a perceiver and vice versa. So there is no subject, no self, without an object or a world in space and time and vice versa. So that's what experience is. But well, what am I on this view? Well, following Dan Zahavi and other phenomenologists, we can say that the minimal subject in the external world, the object, co-arise, though not dynamically, as we'll see. You can't have one without the other. There is a sort of self-consistency relation between the self and the world. So when am I on this view? Well, as Heidegger suggests, human life does not happen in time but rather is time itself. Time is interwoven with consciousness. Where am I on this view? Well, again, back to James from a pluralistic universe. The individualized self, which I believe to be the only thing properly called self, is a part of the content of the world experienced. The world experienced, otherwise called the field of consciousness, comes at all times with our body at its center. Center of vision, center of action, center of interest. Where the body is here, where the body acts is now. What the body touches is this. All other things are there, then and now. So we've already started to bring in temporal experience because it's inherent in this neutral monist picture. But let's address it more, ex more explicitly. Because as we said, it seems like the block universe suggests an extra problem for explaining temporal experience. So does neutral monism help? So let's start with presence. That was one of those three features. You can also call it nowness. And here's what neutral monism says. Presence is fundamental. Presence is the neutral base. And here's how Bill Seeger puts it. On the other hand, neutral monism is a radical doctrine from the usual physicalist standpoint. It knocks the physical as scientifically understood from its perch of ontological preeminence. It suggests that any effort to reduce everything to the physical is fundamentally misguided. Neutral monism has, has to accept the notion of presence and experience, what James called pure experience. This presence is not labeled as consciousness by the neutral monists, since they regard consciousness and its subject as a very sophisticated feature of the constructed mental realm. Nonetheless, presence is, I believe, what funds the, funds the hard problem of consciousness. Presence is what constitutes the what it is like of conscious experience. This is quite explicit in the neutral monist alignment of the neutrals with the qualities of experience 
and especially perceptual experience, the paradigm case for explaining the what it is like aspect of conscious experience. Speaking for myself, I do not think that presence can be denied. The neutral modus claims that it forms the bedrock of reality is surprisingly powerful and fertile and may yet help us understand reality and our place within it. So think about the phenomenology of presence for a second. Every present moment feels special. And even though it feels like that present moment is moving into the future and the past is receding, as that, it, that passage property suggests, nonetheless, it always feels like the present. And present, presence and nowness feel the same everywhere. And for those of you that are inclined to take phenomenological considerations seriously in these regards, you could think about it. When you, when you come out of deep sleep, what's the first thing that you experience? You experience being a self, a, a bare subject in space and time. Those co-arise together, subject in a world in space and time. And when you're in deep sleep, none of that. If you have ever been in deep meditative states, then you know that the only thing remaining is this presence. The, all the other stuff, subject, object, everything else can go away, but this pure presence remains. So neutral monism takes very seriously that presence, right, is not something generated by your brain. It's not some informational updating. It's not a neurological trick. It's fundamental and it's neutral. It's, it's neutral because it's not at all like seeing colors or feeling pain. It's neutral in the sense that it's nothing like qualia. Another way of putting this is that in answer to Wheeler's and Hawking's famous question, presence is what puts the fire in the equation. It's why there's something rather than nothing. It's being itself. So let's talk about passage. We've already given an account of passage. I'm just making it explicit now. And the idea is this, that once you have that subject to object split, then you have a world in space and time. So the subject to object and the world in space and time are both necessary and sufficient for one another. They co-determine each other. So it's a kind of self-consistency relation. This is not a new idea. You can find the same idea in people like Kant and Schopenhauer, and Schopenhauer, and Schopenhauer. In those views, all sort of neo-Kantian views, this, these are sort of like categories in the mind. But in this case, it's not some projection of individual minds or brains. Neutral monism does what Bergson wanted, to turn subjective time into something objective. We are time. And this is a, a tradition now that is uh, growing in cognitive science. So you can look at Mark Whitman's book, Felt Time, which is, which is all about this. And there, there are many other books out there and articles these days, which try to basically give more or less embodied accounts of temporal and spatial experience. And here's how he puts it. Because I have a body, I perceive the passing of time. In other words, because I am a locus, right, moving around in a world, Temporal experience, self-consciousness, and the perception of bodily states and feelings are tightly bound to each other. They cannot be experienced separately. So again, this is built into the phenomenological structure of experience over the neutral. It's not a projection of brains or minds. And again, this is not a new idea. Kant says very similar things about the unity of experience and time, requiring a unity of self and vice versa. He says, otherwise, there's not a, manif a manifold of successors representations. And all this applies to the experience of enduring object. So in other words, we all know this Kantian story, this transcendental idealist story about the categories in which the mind, the brain, or however you know cognitive you wanna think about Kant's story, sort of presupposes and forces these categories on our experience. And on the, the view that I'm trying to explain here, that's sort of right, but it's, it's built into the structure of experience to the neutral as a whole. It's not a projection by the mind or the brain. So on this view, the dynamical character of thought and the world are two sides of the same coin. Kant is right that we don't experience things in time and space, 
but rather we experience them temporally and spatially. But wrong that this is an imposition of individual minds. So now we come back to physics, which was the whole idea here. And immediately, if you think about it for a second, if you take neutral monism seriously, then the very idea that physics and psychology are dichotomous is false because the very idea that you have matter on one side of the equation and mind on the other is false. You just have the neutral, whatever you want to call it. James calls it the field of experience. I think that's a poor phrase because again, it sounds like idealism or sense data, but whatever you want to call the neutral. And especially if you take seriously this view that we've given you about the relational block universe, RBU, then it becomes clear that physics and psychology are not just necessarily or always distinct enterprises. Physics is about psychology. And I don't mean that just in the, you know, the historical sense of psychophysics or something. I mean that our basic physical principles constrain and determine the experiences of the neutral. So if one takes relational block universe and neutral monism on board, then it becomes clear that these various adynamical global constraints from physics we mentioned earlier are constraints on the universal neutral presence that ensure all the various spatial temporal perspectives in, I should say, of the one presence, that they're consistent in every way. So that perhaps sounds crazy, but stop and think about it for a second. Suppose space time matter, suppose this view that we're talking about, this neutral monist kind of view in which you cannot separate out, except from the point of view of, you know, making inductive inferences or pragmatic everyday considerations. When you take seriously this neutral, neutral monist view of the relationship between conscious experience and matter, it's, it's just one thing. And so, if you and you take seriously that it's a block universe and that constraints operating over the entire block are at least as important or even more fundamental than say dynamical equations of motion for explaining what we experience. Now just start imagining removing such constraints. What would the world be like if the relativity principle weren't true? What would the world be like if the light postulate wasn't true? What would the world be like if various conservation laws and the deeper facts that lead to those conservation laws weren't in place. It would be at least, it'd be a world where experience is, is either non-existent, certainly non-existent in the human sense, or it would be utterly foreign. Again, this is exactly the sort of thing that Kant wanted the categories inside the mind to enforce. But we don't need categories inside the mind because Physics, again, which is not separate from psychology on this view, is already doing it. In other words, such adynamical global constraints on space time ensure that no one spatio temporal perspective or point of view is special. So let's come back to the project for a second of relating physics or mathematics to consciousness. I told you in the very beginning some of the standard ways of doing that. And those standard ways, again, all presuppose those three assumptions that lead to the hard problem. And then that means you have to cook up some story about how quantum relates to consciousness or what have you. Typically some dynamical story or there's some isomorphism or whatever. It feels kind of forced because in a dynamical world where physics is fundamental, it's, it's not, even if physics is fundamental, it's not at all obvious there should be any necessary connection between physics and consciousness. And of course, one can mathematize anything. So, you know, think about dynamical systems theory, network theory, whatever you want. The whole trick of those formalisms is we can use them to formally characterize anything. So there's certainly absolutely nothing wrong with looking for neural correlates or information theoretic correlates. That's all really important work to do. But of course, we'll find some mathematical ways of representing consciousness. But does that really explain any of these deep questions?
And even though, even if you think physics is fundamental, that doesn't guarantee that it relates to consciousness in any direct way. I mean, we already know within physics, we already know about effective field theories. So even the relationships between sub-disciplines in different regimes of physics is not obvious or easy to connect. And yet the idea here is to jump directly from physics to conscious experience. But it wouldn't be at all surprising if, for example, neuroscience was quote unquote, an effective field theory. In other words, there's probably a lot of different physics that could underlie what we understand as neuroscience. But again, I'm not, I'm not, you know, there's, I'm not disparaging those programs. I'm just saying in the, the sort of view that I'm selling here, physics is already psychology, right? Even these things that we think of as being fundamental physical principles or constraints. And what is the most fundamental principle behind all this? That there's no preferred frame in the grandest possible sense. There is no center perspectively. So you think about the idea is that such adynamical global constraints ensure that presence is carved up into a world of objects and space and time. It ensures what Kant was hoping the mind would project in terms of the category. And this is an idea that is not Certainly other people have had this sort of idea, even in fundamental physics. Why are there objects? Often in our physical theories, we have to put those in by hands. Diachronic fundamental entities. We put those in, plug those into our differential equations. But other people who have been engaged, for example, in quantum gravity, have played around with the idea that we need to constrain our fundamental theories in terms of some sort of objecthood or things with transtemporal identity. This is what Albrecht and Iglesias call quasi-separability. Again, these are all things we talk about at length in the book. I'm trying to wrap up, I would say more. But the point is, other people, even in standard physics doing quantum gravity, have had these sorts of thoughts. So the idea here is this. Imagine that there's just the fundamental pure presence with a multiple of different spatiotemporal perspectives. And in order to try to give you this idea, I'm going to quote from this story by Borges called The Aleph, which some of you may know about, in which he imagines that it was otherwise. He imagines this magical device where somebody could have every possible spatiotemporal experience at once. Again, I have no idea if that's phenomenologically meaningful or what that would be like, but it gives you the idea by contrast. And here's what he says. Yes, the place where without admixture or confusion, all the places and times of the world seen from every angle coexist. On the back part of the step toward the right, I saw a small iridescent sphere of almost unbearable brilliance. At first I thought it was revolving. Then I realized that this movement was an illusion created by the dizzying world it bounded. The A-list di diameter was probably little more than an inch, but all space was there, actual and undiminished time as well. Each thing, a mere space, let us say, was infinite things, since I distinctly saw it from every angle of the universe. I saw the teeming sea, I saw daybreak and nightfall, I saw the multitudes of America, I saw a silvery cobweb in the center of a black pyramid, I saw a splintered labyrinth that was London, who's thinking of the future. I saw your face and I felt dizzy and wept, for my eyes had seen the secret and conjectured object whose name is common to all men, but which is no one has looked upon, the unimaginable universe. So that gives you a flavor for the sort of idea that we're talking about here. So again, the idea is, we, we call it space-time matter subjectivity, is one thing that has the spatio-temporal perspective that it does because it's constrained by the adynamical global constraints that it is. You, perhaps if you place different constraints on it, as I suggested before, you're gonna get no experience or radically different experience in exactly the way Kant suggested. So it's obvious that on this view, Conscious experience doesn't emerge from matter and isn't an intrinsic property of fundamental physical entities. Thank you.